Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 796th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, the Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Mandy El Saye and Chloe Stagaman. We're also thrilled to welcome poet Emily Martin here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. And here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host, Mandy El Saya's highly process-driven practice is rooted in an exploration of material and language. Executed in a wide range of media, including densely layered paintings, sculpture, installation, diagrams, and sound and video, El Saya's work investigates the formation and breakdown of systems of order, be they bodily, linguistic, or political. Solo and two-person exhibitions of El Saya's work have been organized internationally, and her work is held in many private and public collections. The Brooklyn Rails Director of Programs, Chloe Stagaman, is a curator working with artists in public spaces. She has a BA in French from DePaul University in Chicago and an MA in Art History with a focus on documentation photography and contemporary art from the Courtauld Institute of Art in London. Prior to her time at the rail, Chloe worked as a curator of public art commissions and public pro programs through various roles in London, New York, and Chicago. And it is my absolute honor and pleasure to have Mandy and Chloe in conversation today. And I'm happy to pass it over to you, Chloe. Thanks so much for that introduction, Eleanor. Um, and thanks first to the team at the rail who I greatly admire and enjoy having the chance to work with every day. Um, and thank you to all of you in the audience today who are joining us for this conversation with Mandy El Saye. Mandy, hello from New York to London. How are you today? I'm very happy to be with you all. Thank you for coming, everyone. Yeah, we have similar weather in New York and London today. So similar, you know, atmospheres, cloudy and, and kind of warm, kind of, kind of cool. Um, I'm gonna start sharing some slides and start by walking through my own relationship to your work, Mandy, and then we'll delve into the amateur, um, your exhibition, which is currently on view at Lehman Maupin in New York through April 29th, the end of this week. And I encourage everyone here today to visit the show. It's really, really something. And, and we'll try to cover as much as we can today in the hour that we have. Um, Mandy, I first encountered your work uh, in an exhibition called Cite Your Sources at the Chisholm Hill Gallery in London when I was writing my thesis in graduate school. So the title of the exhibition had a very visceral effect on me as I was writing my thesis um, and thinking about source material and um, living in a history of language and communication about art and about um, photography and information. And since that time, I, at the time of that exhibition, you had an interview with Jennifer Higgy where she asked you what was next for you. And you talked about working in sound and working in performance. And you really have done that over the last few years. Um, and I included here an image of the minimum, an amazing commission you did last year for London Art Weekend, where uh, you looked at minimum versus maximum and had this sort of traveling canvas that went to different sites across London and included performance. And ending here at the amateur, um, which you can now see on the screen. This is one of the installation views of the show, and we'll be able to see several as we talk today. Um, I wonder if you can talk about um, this invitation and this exhibition, which is an invitation into the curious process of the artist's studio. Um, all the many of the works on view in the amateur were made this year. What have you been curious about in your studio and, and what led to the creation of, of this body of work and show? It's more a great question. It's more, I'm not so curious about my own practice as I am how it translates in these white cube spaces. 
So it's like shifting context is the thing I'm interested in. And like this, this idea of like accessibility and this kind of fear that people have if they haven't had the education, how to enter these spaces, what these spaces mean, who is admitted and who is like welcome. And just to be allowed to be in this place of just like curiosity and, you know, just, I like it when kids come in and they're kind of like playing with the surfaces where they're not supposed to, you know? So um, I was thinking about how it would be like to bring aspects of the studio. Obviously it's not the studio I'm bringing in, but similar in that I, how I cover all the space on the walls because I can't bear white space. Even when I take out a piece because I have to stretch it, I have to fill that white space again. So I was thinking about skinning um, the inside of this big uh, gallery. And I often do that in order for me to start existing in it and then other people to, to interact. And when you were thinking about your process, because one of the things I love is you, you work on the floor. Um, and then as you work on pieces, you, you, to create space on the floor, you move them up to the wall. And so the effect in the, in the gallery is uh, an unwieldiness almost. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm stitching together all these pieces, but then also um, a living with your work, a way of constantly revisiting something you've been working on, adding to it, layering it and thinking about it. Is, was that in the back of your mind as you were stitching together and suturing all of these different works in progress on the double height wall in the exhibition space? Yeah, of course. I think to not have one vantage point and to kind of like confuse where the figure on the ground is, where the starting point is, where the kind of hierarchy is. So to have no point of reference or that is just an all over feeling, which is where sound comes in, performance comes in, and then just lending the space to like other people, other, other disciplines. Like I had a few um, dancer friends come in or mover art, move, movement artists come in and just really enjoy seeing them interact with the surfaces. And, and that way it, you're kind of making something something else you're making another relationship so I'm always interested because I'm so insular in my world that I just kind of want to open it sometimes because I go to a point where it's just like a deadlock so how what it means to open up that space and that brings another layer that relationship or that interaction brings another layer as I have layers in the work formally um so it I think the layering thing is just a kind of resistance or wanting to resist any singular narrative um even like palette wise it's like someone said that i, I think it's sandia at, at the gallery said that do i like pink and i was like it's not it's not pink it's like it's like blood and white just lay it on top um i mean the effect from far might be pinky but um lots of layers that just have different effect from different distances um and can mean mean different things so the space can be like a rehearsal space as well as a gallery. It's funny you say uh, pink is in red and white. And also, do you ever think about the virtual world when thinking about your color choices? What do you mean by that? Just, just the digital sphere and, and the, the high resolution colors that we, we experience, you know, searching around on the web. Yeah, I guess like I do a lot, of, like I have a lot of screen cap energy, so beware. <laughs> um, so we draw a lot from, um, from like just screen capping things and integrating that into the work. So this like hyper saturated, mm -hmm. um, I guess that's the kind of version of pop now in a palette, right? And that's what we're kind of exposed to. And so I often think of like how immature my palette is, but in a way it's like, I, I want to see the kind of distinct colors like this coming together to a too, too muchness. I think I always use that word a lot, like what that feels like. Um, in space and in texture um, and in relation as well. Yeah, it's one of the things I noticed right away in your work and really have an affinity towards is that too muchness. And even when I was walking around the exhibition, I was geeking out on the second floor as I watched the um, the canvases kind of, they come just, the linen comes just over the edge of the wall and it's just this, this spilling out and even just, some of the things that are consistent in your work over time. On the left of this image, you'll see one of your net grid paintings, which we'll talk about more in detail, but 
they always operate just off square, um, which to me feels like this spilling over the edge, like they're not quite neat and packed tidy in a, in a perfect square form but they allow to spill over to the next or to spill into the wall or to spill over the edge um mm -hmm. so there's always this layer of there's these elements of the net and the grid but they always are sort of complemented by this unwieldiness and this circulation that's very emblematic of of our time and of living in a moment of multiple sources and um and values and systems of cultures so um, that really does come across in the work. Well, I wanted to start with where you start in the exhibition, which is um, this painting, White Ground Softened. I spent 20 minutes with this work in the exhibition space, looking at it, re-looking at it. I saw it at the start, and then I, I sat with it again at the end. It's a little bit smaller than the other works in the exhibition. It is a perfect square, roughly 42 by 42 inches. And it's a white ground, which you, you've done a series of these white ground paintings. Um, but it seems to encapsulate so many different things that you continuously explore in your work. The bruise, the figure, anatomy, um, a, sort of a redaction of information that leaves just enough there to lead into an investigation and a story. And so I wonder if you can talk about making this work and why you chose to put it at the beginning. Yeah, um, it's a way to understand how I approach um, abstraction. So if you can see, I don't know if we, we can, I have to really zoom in. Can we zoom in a bit? So yeah, so you get the text. So these are taken from like redacted or like cut up pieces from a forensic um, teaching manual, post-mortem. So you have an image of a, of a death and then these are descriptors beneath them, which are like labeled with figures. Um, so I'm always thinking about the figure ground relation. I'm thinking about what happens when you don't have poesis or poetics in certain spaces or certain histories. I'm thinking like quite literally about being, you know, Palestinian and this thing of like, there's no poetry after Auschwitz and what that means and how abstraction can be reached from this really painful point of sheer um, literalness of the body or literal literalness of like death and flesh. And like, so these, like, if you could see, there's some really beautiful bits when you cut them up, like um, this is the top of her, or like begin to soften, they're saying the tissues begin to soften after X amount of immersion time in water so I was just trying to take out the bits that could be seen as like the start of a poem so the heart the internal even though she had she she had been called you know so um and just left them as figure figure fragments and then they're placed in silkscreen on top of a what I call you know a white ground work which is like trying to explore this um idea of priming a surface which all painters do before they start painting so I find it really difficult to talk abstractly about anything or even understand abstraction. So I start with the literal process. So process and material is a way for me to kind of like understand, interrogate, like um, these kind of like psychical or conceptual themes. So priming a surface and then these elements that are disturbing the surface and how it can never be a fully perfectly white ground. There's never a kind of, even unified surface to begin with. There's always disturbances. There's always things that kind of pop out that you have to then always compensating for on top. So these white grounds are the beginning of a, of a grid. And let's say that there's the kind of like bruising underneath there from the linen from the last work because it's bled through the other work. So it's always like time time related residue of the last process. Um, and here like there's there's some possibility of like naming a subject even though it has content so it is abstract the the subject is subtracted so it forms a kind of like painful abstraction in a way well and the use of figure here is so successful in the way that that word itself operates across a chorus of registers you have like the numerical register of the figure the uh, corporal register, the political register, the pedagogical register. And so 
it it immediately is a term that's slippery. It could lead any number of directions. And while you know my first read of this list was obviously the educational figure that you're referring to, the more I looked at it, the more I thought about embodiment in your work about political figures and how we use that terminology to distinguish uh, individuals from others. Um, I wonder how you decided to settle on begin to soften as this injunction at the the bottom of the painting. Um, I always title things like right at the end because I want to see what kind of jumps out at me. I don't want to think about it too much. I'm really like very much in tune with you know procedures of the unconscious so like I pick all the fragments I'm attracted to without thinking too much and that's why I try to give myself as little time as possible before I name something um so it's just it's just the thing so that's the thing that popped out it's just the nicest as well there's also like a little slide of um a little kind of transparency of a, of a bit of a baby and I don't know if it's my age if I'm thinking that way so like it's like I find out about myself after you know yeah. or other people might tell me certain things <laughs> yeah, but but I, when you said about um figure because there's so many ways to understand that and I think this idea of like where are you coming from and how do you understand that word like right before the conversation that we're having now I think you were talking about a hang with someone like a, a like a, a show hang and mm -hmm. in the performance I talk about like what is a good hang and the first time I heard of heard that if you're not from like the art world like that is like a can sound like a kind of a weird like hangout or like right. a, a lynching so like I think figure speaks to that like figure ground is such a thing in painting but it's it's a million other things in different languages or different spheres of um knowledge so um kind of to make that slipperiness apparent is a, is important yeah the, there's there's a slipperiness and then there's also I love how you mentioned the the image of the baby because the softening feels like this radical tenderness um, and sort of a turning towards care. Um, I want to go into the rest of the show, but before I do, I want to ask you about bruising um, and its relationship to your practice broadly. Um, yeah, I think I, as I said, I can't, I'm not a painter that can just manifest something ex nihilo like it has to be literally referring to something um physical or of my body so i think of color in terms of layers and this bruising i guess is the color manifestation of the, that layering and that slipperiness because if you've had a bruise anyone's had a bruise you know it kind of changes over the course of a week and that's just the layers of color separating in your hemoglobin so it starts with a very deep color and then it goes out into a, a greeny, then a yellowy and then a brown. But that's like all the kind of fragments of this hemoglobin like separating and, and seeping down. So you're left with things at the top. So I think of color not in terms of actual color, but in terms of density and like transparencies. Um, so that bruising is like, again, an impossibility to, to say it's one thing. It's, it's, it's lots of things compounded. I think the I hate I hate just hanging one painting by itself because it's not a painting. It's a it's a thing in space with other things that are talking to other things. Yeah. Well, and a bruise is very much a color in motion, right? It's very much a, a sign of something perhaps violent or painful that's happened in the past and a moving towards or striving towards and what how it resolves itself is, you know. Will it be a scar? Will it be, will it disappear entirely? There's something unresolved with a bruise that feels really related to your practice and to how you examine systems of information. Um, yeah. Now we're turning into the rest of the gallery. So right in what we're looking at right now are three of, of your net grid paintings and the beginnings of the floor installation. Um, which you've done a few of these floor installations. And I'm wondering if you can tell us, for especially those of us who aren't familiar with your work, what that process is like and what information you privilege in the creation of the installations. Well, the process is, is very labor intensive. Um, and I think when I, when I give the, um, the space, the idea that I'm doing this, they're like, 
we don't need all of this but you do because I think I want to kind of um show I want to show my working process and how how I build a painting through the wall um through the floor so it's kind of like rep reproducing the kind of studio studio kind of methods which is like there's lots of fragments around you can kind of see there's like I have lots of bits and pieces and then there's a unifying thing which is the latex and then wanting to skin this space so it creates a feeling so when you walk on top of it you get a sticky feeling which then creates a bodily resonance and then the way you look at the paintings is informed by that resonance even if you don't acknowledge it immediately um in terms of the specificity of the things that are layered in there which you can see are silk screened words and sometimes they might be directly silk screened or sometimes they're on like this kind of um tissue membrane are uh, kind of informed by like the archive and then i might randomly pick um so the newspapers are picked for the palette and for its content so there's a fight between content and like form so financial times being peach the saudi one green and it's the only green one i can find and then the new york times and the new york post for its like crazy headlines um and it's sans serif font so they're pickable formal things but there's also the content in there that's fighting with those with the kind of unified overallness that it comes to in the end and how did you land on this, these words? I, I sat with them for a little bit and, and they repeat throughout the installation. Where are these from? Um, these are collected operation name, um, IDF operation names in Gaza, Lebanon and Egypt. Um, and they're kind of slowly disappearing off the internet. So it's this, I think I'm a self-identified hoarder. So this thing of collecting because there's a sphere of scarcity in that. Um, yourself is being erased so you collect more you accrue more when you feel less of yourself so the kind of collecting of words which was like in my notebook like for a number of years so I picked the ones that were seasonal and kind of like a bit um vague the vaguest ones because there's some there's some that are really particular like sharp and smooth and and cast lead or um, grapes of wrath but these ones are the softer ones like thinking of that piece begin to soften so they're they're just like insipid if you don't know the context but if you really want to just pick up a, a thing to zoom into you can get a rich um disturbing history out of it that begins to tell it kind of uh tell of a history there but it's it's impossible to kind of get a full history of that because the sources are so fragmented um in our recordings of it yeah, and I, I want to go back to this image because the floor installation starts a little while after you enter the gallery, and it gets at something that I think about a lot in your work, which is the simultaneous implication and invitation to the viewer, where you're being invited into the work, but also impl implicated in, in its circulation. And uh, when I was, I, I visited the show twice and the second time was a couple of weeks into the exhibition and, and there were high heel marks in the floor and, and it had really worn with time and you could really feel the audience's presence in the gallery space, uh, both in a, in a way that was sort of eerie, like this idea of, of tracking and, and bodies moving through space and, um, which is very reminiscent of how we move through cities these days and, and information being gathered, um, but also which spoke to, in a more tender way, community and engaging with people and 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 keeping keeping relating to them as an artist and not completely closing yourself off to them and to the way they see the work. And I'm curious how you think about that when you make these uh, large installations that often distinguish certain aspects of your exhibitions and spaces. You did it as well at the Chisholm Hale Gallery a few years ago. Yeah, there's a few things I could say about that. First of all, like I want there to be like a feeling of immersion. So it needs to be large scale and quite immersive. So um, there's that that needs to be accomplished through these kind of um, big gestures. And there's also this, this tension, I guess, of implication of myself. Um, when I thought about like, okay, you're, you're doing your next New York show. I thought about, you know, the 20th 
street uh, gallery spaces, how big and grand and masculine they are, and how I always see Warhols there every single time. I always see like Richter's or those, you know, those the history, the great giants, and they're always quite um, they're in circulation all the time. And then you have the new ones there, but they're they're always like mainstays, and they're always hung in this very clean way all the time. I rarely see like um, experimental hangs in these spaces. So I thought what it meant to what the rent was for those spaces, because um, it's saying something to that. Um, and that's when I thought about movement artists working there and how hard it is to have rent to even have something beyond your house to rehearse in. And then what that meant in terms of like circulation commerce. And there's like, you know, images of silk screened um, bills in there. And this idea of like, I'm in that system, so I'm not speaking outside of it or critiquing it. I'm part of it and I'm speaking from that position of like tension. Um, like being invited into the space and having that um, visibility and therefore legitimacy, being a painter. So I think that's like the dominant language. And then from that access point, from that invitation, I can speak my code um, and begin to see what that tension could be saying. Um, so it's a, it's a tough one. It's not, it's not a, a statement. It's more like being in that discomforting resonance or tension all the time. Yeah, and you feel, um, I, you can sort of see it in the image that we're looking at right now. You can see your hand motions in, in the floor and the way that your own body sort of moved over every part of the space. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think of it as a meditative process? Yeah, I do because once you get it's hard to start this off you know it's hard to get into the flow but once you do it's just it's completely non-verbal and even with like a say you have a, a big team of techs working with you once that one in the flow it's like silence you know because it's all the material now doing its thing with the movement so i think a lot of the the works come from that space because this way of dealing with the too muchness is to go into flow states um and the grid started out from that like now I can just shut myself up with all this information and just uh, rein it in, you know? Right. And so there's this interesting tension because I, I can completely relate to the, your idea of the flow state. And I know you listen to headphones while you work. And, um, and that was kind of part of how you thought about this show and part of how you thought about the, the performance piece. There's a sound piece. Um, that goes with this exhibition. Maybe we can talk about that for a second and you can describe what went into that and your collaboration um, there. And then I'd love to know too, like you listen to music while you work. And so there's this simultaneous um, internal mental uh, process of, of, and it does sort of feel in the exhibition space like you're entering, we're entering your mind. Um, but it, there's also this element of um, entering something, a physicality that we are, a physicality of something that we're already living with, a, a physicality, a physical rendering of, um, uh, of an unwieldiness to daily life and to the way information is circulated. Um, but I wonder, let's talk about the sound work, because I feel like that's an am amazing addition to the show. And and gets at some of those ideas as well. Yeah, so for the, there are two sound pieces, one for the performance, which was formed out of fragments, similar to how the paintings are, so collected fragments of conversations I had with the, my shrink and things I listened to on YouTube or, uh, or conversations on WhatsApp, just these informal conversations and things on Instagram. So again, it's like this overflow of like information that lacks any distinct um, narrative. And then throughout the show, there was um, another sound piece for superimposition projection, which was more meditative. And it has this like dinging sound, which came from like the tap just dripping into a glass and it created like those Tibetan bowl sounds. Um, so that was the start of like thinking that gave structure to the video. So every ding was every three seconds, which I thought about you know, the flash photography before a horror film when you get the flash and it goes 
and then you get a different image each time from the dark. So that's how the, that video came came about. Um, but I wanted the sound to be less murderous. So I'm always thinking about death in relation to its opposite, which is like potential or transcendence or growth. Um, and bodies always being a problem once you enter them into the abstract space, because then you have the problem of contingency and specificity and historicity. Um, so I'm always thinking about, about that, that tension there. Yeah, it made me think about the, the sound, at least when moving through the exhibition, and we'll show everyone uh, a, a snapshot of the performance so you can see it and hear some of the sounds. Um, but the sound within the exhibition as you walk through reminded me of being on a crime scene and you know how in crime tv shows they really like accentuate the sound of the journalist camera like going <laughs> <all> around the, <laughs> um but also sort of an uncanniness like a clock that's that's off track or or not going at the beat of a second um it made me think about changing relationship to time um or or coming into a space and re-grappling with with notions of time um the video the the projection was really exciting to see and the projection adds this whole new layer to the idea of living collage in your painting and bringing the paintings even more alive through moving image um how did you source the images in the projection uh in the gallery so um it's based on the title of the piece so Superman's position came from this I, I'll get the quote wrong um Tiffany correct me if you're there um um where Freud talks about dreams um not being a collage more a superimposition of details and fragments on top of each other so that's how I think of the unconscious that it's not one discrete thing which one discrete thing we could align with the consciousness but the superimposition is the unconsciousness these disparate fragments coming together so um these bodies, you can see a bit of the body there, are like whitewashed backs of these two movement artists who came to the studio and allowed me to use their backs as projection screens for um, moving um, circulating images of details of the studio. So their backs became the white ground, similar to that first piece we talked about. And then I also have this um, artist friend that is in residence at the moment. And she talked about the back being the site of where the interface for the spirits to talk to, to make communication with the body. So like the back as an interface, but the back also as a screen, as a projection screen for uh, meaning. Um, and again, it's just like a really literal way of bringing back the body in, into this kind of abstract um, space. Cause there's, it doesn't figure in any of the paintings except for this superimposition piece. And all the colors again, reflect that bruised tone and how those bruised tones are formed from many many different layering um, processes. Yeah, and from here, I, I incorporated a few details of the wall work um, and and we'll, we'll move into some of the net grid works as well, but the, the works throughout the exhibition incorporate this netting or this, this, this grid that's imperfect, that's sort of layered on top of each other and creates this composition, foreground, background, it almost to me sometimes feels like a sieve that you've you've like carefully sifted all this information and you're bringing it forward to the viewer and being like look one more time before it <laughs> before it passes through um and it sort of uh sifts out all of these these pieces of information and there are a few recurring schematics in this show um that are were incredibly interesting to me and I want to hear you you talk a bit about them the first is the currency um which is everywhere I mean all over the wall all, all over the the finished pieces as well and when you were thinking about currency I mean it it's apt in the sense that it's um it's a medium of exchange that is also associated with icons of of power and of nationhood and of citizenship. Um, but how were you thinking about currency? And there are many different currencies represented in the exhibition as well. Yeah, so um, again, the 
everything starts from the literal. So there's this formal relationship to how, how currency looks like. So I have my little show and tell box right next to me. And I have this fake, these fake kind of like notes. Um, they're meant for, they're meant to kind of like reproduce the kind of hell money that you burn for your ancestors, but they're British ones. Um, so if you look at money, it's kind of very similar to the, to how the bruises form. They're very layered because they want to prevent fraud and, and counterfeit. Um, so if it's more complex, it's harder to kind of fake. Mm -hmm. So this idea of like, it's palette, it's transparency, it's the similar kind of thing I work with, but obviously those overarching conceptual things of exchange of bodies and exchange and, and economies and how the kind of reality of these spaces and being in those spaces also. Those things are actually secondary to the formal qualities of a print. I'm thinking of print reproduction and actually those formal um, things. So in this, it's a good one to land on. Um, we got we got the hundred dollar bill that actually doesn't look that complex. It's quite simple. That one I'm not that fond of. But there, those two stamps from the passport come from my brother's passport, and I have them here. So I want to do a show, another show and tell. So a, a decent British passport, like it has many layers underneath you know the blue and, and the greens and they're quite complex and I remember the sadness I felt when I kind of looked at this Egyptian passport because if you're Palestinian you don't get a Palestinian passport you get an Egyptian one um and they're it's really shitty the print it's really impoverished it's one color and it's not that it's not that complex so I remember the feeling it gave me and I was like okay how can I think through this idea of like print complexity and like bring it back to kind of like um, some kind of equality, <laughs> even if it's within a painting, because it just, it made me really sad actually just holding these objects. I have my special box where I keep all my kind of, if they allow me, my friends' old passports and like precious things. And they often have really beautiful colors. Um, so this thing had this weight and, and sadness on it. And, I have my dad's ones in there too. So I just kind of wanted to speak to those things and like put them on an even plane, I guess. So I switched up the colors. I picked this really beautiful blue that I mixed with um, someone here that works in a studio, which is like this um, metallic blue biory color and this kind of fluorescent pinks that you see in, in stamps in it when you get your passport stamps and just, um, giving it some life, I guess. So they yeah. come from really simple impulses in that way. Well, and the way they, they track movement, your movement, but also the movement of some imaginary person moving between notions of borders or of countries. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, as you recreate there, cause there's, it's repeated um, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's fainter and mm -hmm. other times it's very, very defined. Were you thinking about that as well um, in your process of uh, continuously printing these dollar bills as well as these passport marks? Yeah, definitely. I think this idea of like that is born out of anxiety of like wanting to record, track, print, um, repeat, mm -hmm. reinstate without being explicit. Like actually it's repetition has more of a kind of psychical imprint um on you than saying anything but it's just the repetition gives gives a sense of something vague um but it's present you know for sure and um another motif or a schematic throughout the exhibition is gucci um and then this sort of alias that recurs um and i wonder if you can tell us a bit about where that alias comes from and how you're thinking through that juxtaposition and slippage mm -hmm. so yeah I like to use really kind of simple almost stupid pop references to things like if you miss it you miss it kind of thing um but if you really want to kind of approach it from a forensic angle then you get a whole different parallel history mm -hmm. so to like the painting being on the wall if you need if you have, if you have a big house you can fit the painting through your door but the painting on the floor is like a reference to a solitary confinement cell. So those dual realities are always present and on top of each other. So Gulf Zero United, Charlie Charlie. So you can see the bootleg one under the real one is my father's like call sign as a practitioner of ham radio, which is amateur radio. It uses 
high frequency radio waves in order to make communications around the world in a hobbyist kind of um, framework. So it's like this, it's like an art practice for him. I'd say it functions as an art practice. It's just to make proofs of existence and points of contact with other people across the world using the electromagnetic spectrum across the globe and the sun's rays. So it's utilizing all these things that exist. And then it's kind of like, it's like surfing these invisible waves. And then you make these connections as like proofs of your endeavor. So it's quite a beautiful thing because you're not making conversations once you make that connection. You just say your call sign, you say your kind of like wattage or your kind of your coordinates and you move on. You might ask about the weather, but the fact that you've made it is the point, you know? So I think having this kind of really recognizable um, uh, logo and then this kind of um, passenger, this passenger kind of alias riding on that temple power is, um, important when you're thinking about like these dualities that exist throughout the show. Amazing. Um, in terms of the rest of the works, I think at this stage, I'm gonna move to the performance so we can talk a bit about that and um, gonna zoom out here and show the audience the performance, if that's all right with you, Mandy. Yeah. Um, and that way you can see it before we talk about it. And this was at the, the opening of the exhibition. Yeah. You haven't been to the border, Kamala said, and I haven't been to Europe. And I mean, I don't understand the point that you're making. I'm not discounting uh, the importance really to, to of the border. I built up stress build up. Just to make sense of what you're telling me is our usual uh, sign because the reality is more really stressful Gulf Zero, and United the Charlie and Charlie 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 Gulf Zero, United Charlie 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 Stay with me. Let me finish my thought, okay? I want to get you to some doctors that will check you out. All your physical things, check everything out. You mean like this? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can you get a close up of that, please? I'm directing. You're doing a good job. So a good it's a genre. hang. It's a genre. What is that? Not everybody fits on the rasta. So the performance that we just saw a, a snapshot of from is called, and I'm gonna perhaps mispronounce this, <laughs> but I'm gonna give it a good solid try. Uh, Akathesia. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, it's called Akathesia. What is Akathesia and how does it relate to how you were thinking about the performance? Um, it's something I experienced in 2020 when I had like a break from reality, let's say a nervous breakdown. Um, and I didn't know what it was until like after. So I, I stopped being able to speak properly, make sense properly and work. So I stopped painting and all I could do was like these it feels like there's a motor inside your body that's just revved up and that you can't, it's painful in your joints to sit still. So it's like, it, it, it looks like you're dancing, but you're not, you're like in pain and everything. It was like a lightning shot going throughout all your joints and it doesn't end. So um, I thought about superimposing these um, images on top of that movement and what that feeling could feel like if it was a performance. Um, I needed a partner to work with as well. At the time, I also needed a partner to get me out of that mental headspace. Um, and so this was a less choreographed piece, it's more like um, an improv. So the dancer that I work with, she picked, I asked her to pick a few songs that she could groove to, that she likes, that, and that's internal. And then 
from the outside you're getting you're getting what you heard so we have a different reality to what the audience is is hearing so there's some part where it goes into a flow state where it's quite beautiful and then it goes back into this jerky jerky type things and i think there's also this parkinsonian uh, disorder or chorea which refers to choreography that is also a similar thing where the movements seem go from like flowy to like jerky so i thought about something being painful and ecstatic at the same time and and what what that tension is also thinking a lot about mental health and psychical realities that not necessarily outside can see um when you're like in this kind of professional professionalized environment because it's really hard to see if someone's baseline is normal if you kind of like descend into a bad space it takes quite a while for you to get help and for other people to recognize that right um, and so my only kind of dominant language is is is, is the work and that thing that ties me to reality which is also semi-delusional if I take that away then I might be just left untethered in the in the sunken place you know so I'm always thinking about how lucky I am that I have that um that net to catch me well the collaboration feels so essential and exciting in the practice as well because it creates this distance between you and the other performer or performers that then is a possibility or an extension to this this broader understanding of the work um, and to the practice that you've been doing for a while of thinking about audience and thinking about viewer. Um, in the in the performance and the bit that we watched, there's definitely it definitely feels there's a commentary on surveillance or the random search. And it feels uh of um, reminiscent of something you've been exploring between the min the relationship between the minimum and the maximum getting picked out from the crowd um, the it made me think of Reese Ahmed and and the work that he's done to think about that secondary search process in the airport um, and I wonder how you were thinking about that in the making of the performance and also in how you were thinking about what you just talked about, which is the sound, you're listening to a soundtrack and you're in the mode in the studio at night working on these paintings. And then there's a whole vast world outside in London working and living and experiencing these cultural significances that you're thinking about and brooding on. Um, and this really feels like an embodiment of that. And I wonder if you think of it that way, or if you think about it, I um, mean, I'm sure you think about it many ways, but I'm curious to hear. No, that's definitely all in there. So there's this thing of like being so privileged, mm. but also this kind of paranoia that comes out of it. So when I was ill, there's certain words that were in the tabloids that I thought were like speaking directly to me, like, or like advertisements, like you have been selected, you're selected in the symbolic universe to have this space, you're so fucking lucky. But also all lies are new. And then the paranoia can manifest in this kind of like the background or like, should I change my name? Because like that already gives them, you know, the baddies like some, in, like, you know, I'm, I'm visible now, like I'm here. So this, this double-edged sword of being visible and then being a target. And every time I come into US, not now, cause I opened up a case um, thanks to people I work with that um, I, my name will always be selected for, for search. Um, and, you know, some people haven't have gone through life without that ever happening. So it's like every time a fucking eye roll, I look to my left and there's another brown person giving me the same eye roll, like every single time. But then again, going back to the formal, formal qualities, like when I actually observe the kind of search, it's like a really beautiful, continuous movement, you know, because they want to touch you the least amount to get over this thing. And this question of like them asking, can I touch you? but not, you're not really not meant to answer that, you know? So I just have consent, the kind of choreography of that violence, the softness of it. So in, in the full performance, it is like, it's quite like, it's quite intimate and sexual. It's like quite grindy. And then it kind of goes into the, you know, the kind of um, dominant thing. Um, so that element of erotics that's embedded in capitalism and how that is never satisfied in order for it to perpetuate itself. So again, these fine line type things, the surveillance, the name, the kind of histories. So without saying, making you feel those things. Um, and again, just being really privileged, like an artist, every single artist is super privileged because they're doing that thing. But at the same time, you're alienated in choosing that title for yourself. 
um, and you're working from that position of alienation, that's what art is. You can't have something that's like fully already in language, otherwise it wouldn't be art in its conception. Yeah, and you know, that was one of the biggest takeaways I had from the exhibition was you sort of examining that privilege from every angle and really thinking about it, especially after having several very successful exhibitions in your career and being at the stage of really examining it head on and, and thinking about how to um, how to look at it. One of the elements of this exhibition that you've, you've mentioned, but I'd love to hear more about is um, offering up the gallery space to performers uh, as a rehearsal space throughout the duration of the exhibition. And what has that opened up for you? I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to make make the space and then to have uh, performers come in and use it as they wish um, and sort of what that might have opened up in your own practice or in the way you think about your work. Yeah, so the, this idea initially came out from, again, that that terrible time um, in 2020 mm -hmm. and just spiraling in my own head and like realizing the limits mm -hmm. of what I could do with myself and a surface. So I exhausted all these things. And then needing a relationality, needing and accepting like, yeah, I need help. You know, essentially, yeah, I need intimacy or yeah, I need a community. Because actually previous to that, I was like, no, I'm fine. I'm totally fine by myself. I really like pride in myself that I don't really miss people. Even if I do love them, I can go like months. And But then when you're fucked like that, you do need people. <laughs> so like, um, so it actually came out that urgency of just really wanting to see, to have someone take me out of myself mm -hmm. and just like having this, I wanted a mirror body. Um, so the call out was someone similar height to me and to do these actions and see what their frame of reference and their knowledge could do with my knowledge and in order to extract me from my own kind of like spiral. So now this is an ex working on from that, that progression of that thought and inviting movement artists to come into the studio and just seeing how they see things because a completely different framework they're not used to big white spaces for example so everything when they when they go to gallery it's like why is it so big it's such a waste we could be doing all this stuff you know so um surface interactions and those and those simple things and um again seeing what another language is translating of this because mm. i don't trust what we're given in this framework alone i'd want to i want to see other other relationships to it so it's like it's such a privilege for me to to have that so it's a kind of mutual mutuality I think of generosity like the fact that people are willing to come to a space that's un unknown to them and this was an experiment like I was fully open to like no one coming just putting it out there and see what happens because I would I can understand how that would happen because these are kind of rarefied spaces like when you go to art school you have to go with a, you first go with a group and they tell you where they are and they tell you how to read the blurb and all those things that you know are really scary for people who haven't been through the interpolation process of, of being a reader of art mm -hmm. um so I was fully expecting for no one to turn up but there was a few that turned up and that is really um yeah it's quite um touching for me to see that just this kind of tentative relationship like what can I what can I do with these spaces you know yeah and it's really cool it sort of bonds the show even more so to New York, right? As a, as a city where space is such a commodity and, and so inattainable. Um, as someone who recently moved back to New York and had to locate an apartment, you know, it's, it's, it's really out of control. So the chance to engage that and to think about offering up a space that then becomes a collaboration with the work and a collaboration for you. It's, it was fascinating to know that you had done that. And um, I'm glad that people did use the space. Yeah. <laughs> um, my last question is about the title, The Amateur. Um, why did you choose to title the exhibition The Amateur? It actually came out of um, the, the blurb for the show. So, um, my studio manager was writing and doing her etymology research. So amateur comes out of the Latin amare, which means out of love. And I guess with all these layers of, 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 of commerce and professionalism and all these things that alienate you from the reason why you even started in the first place, it's just a reminder of like the, the artist impulse and being true to that initial artist impulse. And the dominant language is that kind of overlay on top of that it shouldn't 
be the thing it should be coming from that impulse so I think again it's me entering like this movement space I'm not I don't have that language but I'm gonna make myself vulnerable enough maybe let myself be embarrassed to go into into that movement space similar for someone coming from another space to enter and look at and behold these works so again using my father's practice as like a framework mm. just kind of like just stay connected with why you do this in the first place because he does it for no other reason and for not for no recognition other than to make proof of himself of these connections that already exist and I think that's that's really kind of nourishing and beautiful to just keep staying in touch with well, that's confusing, but that's the truth <laughs> Well, I want to thank you so much for your generosity in answering all of all of these questions about the exhibition. I know we have some questions from the audience and I want to give everyone who's here today the chance to ask your questions. So I encourage you to post questions in the chat if you have them or to raise your hand, but I'll pass it over to you, Eleanor. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you so much, Chloe. And thank you, Mandy. That was such an incredible conversation, amazing questions and such yeah such generosity Mandy thank you um we do have some questions from the audience so our first question is from GE and I'll read on his behalf GE wrote in thinking about the bruises of these paintings and what we might take from them is it not to know that we acquire them but to know and learn how we endure them thank you I mean I think that's a statement in itself right <laughs> um, I wouldn't know how to answer that. That is, a, yeah, encapsulates everything, I guess. Um, and I think this idea of time, endurance, and process is really important, as opposed to identity in a discrete form or this like discrete understanding of things. Just the living with. I remember like there's, there's a lot of like the phrase "living with" is really big and. COVID times just like okay we have to not think of a solution in that sense we have to think of li living with enduring yeah definitely thank you so much um our next question will be from Madison um hi Mandy thank you so much for sharing your work and a little bit about your process um the idea of free will came to mind when you were speaking, especially when you were discussing um, one's experience um, at uh, airport securities or border crossing screenings and this idea of being asked for consent, but that consent is not really as much within your power as they would like to have you believe and it brought to mind the um the ways in which um in religion at least predestination and free will come up against each other this idea that we have free will to make our own choices but that some higher power has also simultaneously already decided and is knowledgeable of what's going to happen mm -hmm. and i feel like that also kind of reminded me of um, the things you were discussing about your own experience with um, mental health and mental illness and where personal free will comes into play there. So I was curious if any of those themes were a factor for you of free will in your process and your practice. Thank you, Madison. That's a great question. Um, yes, I always talk about the importance of chance encounter. like the meeting of two things and how that can create something unknown. And that yes, we have will some effect in, in like meeting surfaces, but we don't have uh, control over what happens in that. So I guess like I'm always setting up parameters in order to explore that chaos element um, because a lot of what I'm interested in is, is the unconscious and seeing after the fact and going into it in a, not knowing place because I think when you go into something with knowledge like I really like this phrase like knowledge doesn't cure the symptom like however much you know consciously it's not going to help your suffering right um but you can form new language you can form new alliances and you can form these kind of 
environments for like connection or love to happen or um, this kind of em environments. Um, so yes, where free will sits in that constellation, I wouldn't be able to say, but consciously setting up parameters to be open to that and to be open to the unknowing is where I would like to align myself with. Amazing. Thank yeah, you. So thank you, Mandy. Much. That was such a great question, Madison. Um, I would love to ask a question, Mandy. And again, if anybody else in the audience would like to ask, please raise your hand or send a message in the chat. Um, looking at your work, especially the grid pieces, um, I really was thinking a lot about maps and borders. And I know this is something that you touched on in today's dialogue, but I guess I was wondering if you could speak more about those themes in your work and in your practice, or maybe do you ever use maps in your collages? I know you mentioned the passports, but do you ever use maps or do you ever make maps? Yeah, I mean, I often literally put maps in, collage them in. Um, I once did this like silly experiment in the studio where I just put a drone over a, a grid painting because everything's made on the floor. And they read as like, maps and then kind of like the eye of god is at the top but the moment you kind of put them on the wall they you lose that kind of paranoiac um surveillance element of it so this thing of like i think the grid is this thing of like it's trying to capture it's trying to demarcate but the grid that i use is just like a really weak wobbly kind of uh vulnerable grid that's just like becoming part of the contents as well so I guess the impossibility of classification taxonomy and these violences that these things can perpetrate once they're enforced. So it's quite a pathetic kind of holding system. <laughs> At the same time, wanting to hold myself, because hold, hold myself back because there's an endlessness. Like you can see everything, every surface is covered. So I always talk about the vitrine tables that I make being like the structure of a, like an analytic session. So the border, of the metal table is the end of analysis is the end of um the session the analytic session otherwise it'll just continue to spread in a in an endless like metonymic pre-association like this goes on to this goes on to this and when you're really manic there's this thing that happens in speech where or flight of ideas where you just riff off the last thing and you're just like going on and on and on and on and it's like this poetry that doesn't make any sense or isn't that good but all the words start meaning really having heavy salience to you because they're just riffing off its last thing. They just never stop. Thank you so much. That was really cool. <laughs> um, I think we have one more question from Chloe. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna take advantage of this opportunity, Mandy, and and ask you one more question. Um, I think there's such an uh an intelligence behind embodying the circulation of images and and sort of the plethora of sources trustworthy or not that we exist within because in embodying them you can you can speak to a lack of care perhaps or a lack of attention to an organism that's failing and an, an organism that that isn't always serving everyone to the best that it can and I often, when I look at your work, I often think about how easy it is to separate myself and my daily existence from where I receive information and where, what I'm viewing on a daily basis. And so in thinking about it as a body itself, not even a human body, a body in any form or shape, it can be wounded, it can be imperfect, it can be... Um, called into question as, as a structure. And I wonder if you think about your work that way and when you first decided as an artist that you wanted to think about information in the language of embodiment. I think a lot of the themes pick you, you don't pick it. So I, didn't, I don't think I'd say I pick the body. The body is like there, you know, I live with, the parent that has chronic illness and mm. this precarious body that's always threatening to fall apart but then it's like also this vulnerable body vulnerable body is also a creative body because it kind of 
makes up and compensates in different ways in mm. order. So then that subject becomes more knowledgeable in sense because they understand precarity means also creativity. And I really love this Winnicottian phrase that if you don't allow disintegration to happen, you're not staying true to the creative process because mm. for something to reform, it needs to kind of separate. And I think we're so scared of like losing ourselves um, that we always ward off the disintegration. So embodying those things, I like this thing, trustworthy or not, and seeing how they affect the body. It's dangerous if you really take that directly as in mental health, heart, right. self -harm, all those things. Um, but if you have the kind of buffer that is aesthetic practice or a practice, you can, you can do the reality testing there without harming yourself, but also interrogating these things that are in play in our like um, culture and how we consume them. I think they're all like test reality testing, like reality testing with my friends, talking, speech, material, in order to not hurt yourself or hurt others, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. Thank you, Chloe. I'm so glad we got to hear that one. Um, and our final question before we move on to a poetry reading will be from Fong. Thank you. Thank you, Leonor. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you. For a, a thoughtful conversation with Chloe here. I was in and out, didn't catch the whole entirety of this conversation, but I will super soon. But I did, I'm sort of aware of your work. And in hearing medicine bringing up the idea of free will and then so much of the work uh, as I was thinking about the notion of freedom, you know, freedom from and freedom to uh, as the role artist, what we must do. So the presence of freedom means the absence of dependence. And I was thinking how the multitude of layers of imagery is implied in some form of palimpsest. I love that word lately. Palimpsest is a ghostly but teeny of time, a form of erosion, like the way that we contemplate cave paintings for a certain spiritual elevation of the testament of what's made, of what is recorded of the event, social event or hunting event, whatever that construct was to those people. So I was thinking in creating that palimpsest that, you know, you talk about endurance, which came from GE's question. Uh, oftentimes endurance and erosion coexist in some way. So pictorially speaking, I, are you conscious when you make those image overlap from one to the other, have that kind of Palium says, pictorially speaking, Mandy. Yes, um, thank you, Fong. Um, yes, I'm always thinking about erasure of meaning through saturation. I mean, so in thinking of how I approach abstraction, it's through this palium type oversaturation of things. So I wanna, I wanna preserve, which is where the latex holds the latex, but the latex is also dying because it's it's um, it's organic, right? But it has mm -hmm. this transparency that you can see all the layers through it. You can see all the colors of all the fragments. So it's holding all these things in space. But at the same time, there's so, so much, there's so much information that you can't read anything particular into it. And then you lose meaning yeah. through that layering, which is similar thinking about processes of like how, how news works or how um, um, ideology works in terms of associating with other things or co-opting other kind of movements in order to kind of erase certain kind of histories or kind of um, mm -hmm. important uh, breaks in reality through just co-opting or reassociating. Mm -hmm. So there's this thing of free association, which is like a freedom of sorts, but there's also this thing of co-opting, which is like a kind of uh, a violence of that as well in order to take away its power, which I think because I'm so literal, I do that pictorially. So very, um, observant in, in noticing that. But it's a, it's a tough question to talk about the, the freedom thing. Cause at the, I think like all artists are 
have freedom because they're picking this or they're choosing ethically to work from this position of alienation and free association mm -hmm. but at the same time it's like you're not included in the kind of in, a, in other systems so I, I think about like the suffering body as being part of that or um you know what it what it means to be in in states of duress and what psychosis is a good example you have this kind of radical freedom because you're not tethered to other people's reality but at the same time your body is like suffering so much and the pain is so great that sometimes you feel there's no other option but to like snuff it so free like what perspective are you talking from there's always this tension of something really total and open and also very fucking painful um so i think a good work is always residing in that resonance between those kind of dualities. Well, Hannah Arendt say freedom is politics. <laughs> so it's a labor, the body is political. Mm. Um, you know, no more, no less than Sisyphus pushing that boulder up the rock on top of the mountain only to know that it will roll down and he had to do it again. Either that or commit suicide. I think we chose the <laughs> yeah, we, have, we have ethics. At least. We have ethics. That's, 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 that's right. So congratulations so much. <laughs> Great <laughs> question. Thank you. Back to you, Chloe. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you so much, Fong. That was a really awesome question to end on. Um, and just a huge thanks again to Mandy and Chloe for the incredible dialogue. Um, we have a tradition here at the rail of closing our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Emily Martin, to the stage. Emily Martin is a writer and teacher from Brooklyn. Her most recent chapbook, Dependence, the, the Joystrix, How You Are Made, was published by Hiding Press in 2023. And I'm so happy to have you here, Emily. Thank you all so much. Um, and thank you for that conversation. It was like, yeah, simultaneously resonated so much and taught me so much. Um, so I really, really loved listening. Um, thank you. Um, I'm gonna read a part of a poem from that chapbook called Dependence, the Joystrick slash How You Are Made. Because they were not mine to know, the trees untouching themselves, we will remain. We can do everything of friendship and all the other things. The mage untouches, the night sky shining lets the moving world move you. It was beautiful, it had a hatch, an idea or treatment for trees burning on the inside may include different temperatures of feet and the sun, the other one. And ought not angels' constipation turn a brief exchange into a gift? A lovely, lovely soup. Lime soup, I want to remember. Your mind's graceful container partaking, torn to pieces this depth, out of nowhere bucolic, which world and how much apart? Spent your life on the ocean for an audience of one, leapt into the arms of circumstance. When she calls, does she wear bracelets? And on this very midnight, cease to want to talk to me or put me in this scalar light, white swatches of cloth I will have to, graceful container, tear to pieces. How you are made in a bleakness, bleak and merriment, bleak and not without merriment, as you change your mind like so many dancers, rehearsing glances held over glass and flame, I will read them over and over your wild and tiny addresses. Leapings and grimacings weep below the turnpike, morning light at kitchen table, why would anyone else be in love with these pieces of light like I am in the morning? Cloak this that delighted you once surprised you enough that you built your whole life around it, eluded you long enough to keep at it forever. There's no end. There is infinity inside you and you can be a sportsman to it, a comedic sportsman. 
But later on the phone, I don't feel like that's who I am as a person. I don't feel like tracking supply chains of cashmere or fiberglass, angles of reclining threshers, congealed vectoral lamb underfoot you were born under a disseminating moon. Go with them to their worlds and days, resplendent world, it is not going to survive. It is going to survive, extinguish. Truly to you, I am speaking in my name. I have gone outside and come back in to sit at this table and tell you what I think about the resplendent world and its attendance. It is not a dream to say we have the right to stay alive without proving our worth. I will not. I will go outside, count the leaves on the trees, how they get to the ground when the cause is desire to punish. Sometimes I want to punish myself too. Certain small packets are made and given by those who come to grow you up and take your coat of awe and usher you into the jellied furnace. Oh, your scrapbooks, your little ribbon collage, whoever drops their mask or confesses to jealousy or doesn't fear the ridiculous winds up wretched, that's the law. I am not dreaming. I am not on horseback. I am not on wings without a head. I could be the executioner of those who use violence to prevent the removal of suffering. They're combining, aren't they? They're getting close. But when you talk to other people, you're shocked by what they say, where they're coming from. Another pain, like an iridescent bruise, appears down the hallway, just a sidestep away. Another iridescent pain, the trees are bare, the veils are out, the lightest of green and lilac and deep red and thinnest blue, the thinnest blue in the air, slight and more intricate technologies of the dead that you loved and kept company those others so long in their infinite books. You've been showing them how to use the computer, haven't you? Computer classes for the long dead led by the recently dead. You're teaching them how to use the internet. Well, I just want you to know that I got your message and I thought it was beautiful. Truly to you, I am speaking in my name, in this section for a group she calls. There is much crossing of hands, trailing a little behind. They were stopped, wondering whether any had heard a voice asking at night in the mulberries or how did the daylight get in there and how will the meaning come out in the morning? Morning arrived and it did milk him as we wrestled with birds and were moved out into the itchy bogs go the quietest to sit in the juice with our lossless echoes. That halo around you is just another person. Thank you. Oh my gosh, Emily, thank you so much. <laughs> that was, thank that you was all. Stunning. Thank I, you. The, the bruise was... Um, a, a, a coincidence that is that I was really touched by while I was listening to you all and knowing what was coming <laughs> that was that was incredible that was so beautiful thank you thank so you. much thank you all um, so much yeah it's been such a special event today um huge thanks to everyone for tuning in this afternoon thank you again Mandy and Chloe Thank you to Alejandro from Lehman Maupin and Anna from Mandy's studio for their support in preparing for today's event. We would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program to make these daily conversations possible and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, the Rail has been a platform for the arts culture and politics through our monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail and join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a forest canopy, a rail reading curated by Jay Bessemer featuring Janice Lee and Henning J.P. Garcia. And you all can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
go see the show in New York if you're yeah, here. Yeah, it's closing. It's closing at the end of the week, I think. Yeah. Yes, you have this week. Um, it's so it's such a great show. Everyone should go see it. Yeah, Thanks, thank guys. you so much, Emily. You. Your words were incredible. Thank oh, you. Mandy. Thank you. Your your words, but all of <laughs> your such words. Such a beautiful were like closure. So really appreciate it. Was. That. Absolutely. It was perfect. Thank oh, you. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs>